Hello, good evening. Welcome everybody to our new, another session of our event. Um, I would like, I have, I like to first go through the slides we have got here. Um, it's, we have, we have webinar series measures for assuring projects. And I would like to introduce very recommended Tim Podesta and Hardil Pool, who, and they would talk through measures for assuring projects. It's very practical. And the next, and if you want to see our BCS, uh, we have social media channels, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, in your own time, have a look. The slides will be passed, passed on to everybody. If you want to take notes, fine, but uh, slides will come, come to everybody tomorrow. I hope uh, we'll pass it on tomorrow. Um, I like to introduce the two speakers, as I said, and um, if you have any questions, uh, you won't be able to speak directly. I suggest you write the questions down on the chat or questions, and I will be able to see them, and I will, I will actually ask the speakers for any answers. So I hope this will be okay. 16th of, I'm going to talk about next month, we are having another wonderful event on 16th of June, and that's mind map your WBS to project success. Please go ahead um, and on BCS event calendar and book it. Um, so we welcome to, we would hope to see you next month as well. Um, I, uh, any questions? Yeah, just pass it on to the webinar, so and I'll see you next month as well. But without much ado, I'm going to pass it, pass the screen to the speakers. It's Tim, Tim Podesta, and Hardil Fool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Viva, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Tim Podesta, and I'm leading this webinar on behalf of the Association of Project Management Assurance, SIG, the Special Interest Group. A big thank you to the BCS for the opportunity to share what we've learned and what we're doing. I've been active in, in the APM and the Assurance SIG for over 10 years now, and I led a working group developing the document Measures for Assuring Projects, which we're going to share a little bit with you tonight. In terms of my background, I celebrated 35 years with BP, and after completing my time with them, I am now an independent consultant with experience as a program director in government projects, and I'll share parts of my experience throughout this webinar. Now, in terms of admin, uh, please be aware the webinar has been recorded, and you are in listen-only mode. However, please do participate with the content by writing questions in the question box that you will have on your screen. We'll take those if we can as we go through, but we do have a plan to have sufficient time at the end for a Q&A session, which will be moderated by Viva. There are also a couple of polls for you to respond to as well, so please, please look out for those. Now, after the webinar is finished, you will receive an email providing links to the webinar and also the document which we'll be sharing with you today or talking about. And the email will also include a survey link. And we're very, very keen to get the feedback. So please provide the feedback as soon as you get that survey so your answers are, are fresh. Really, that's for LRS and BCS to improve our webinars in the future. So if we move to the next slide, please, Viva, this is the agenda for today. It's in two parts primarily. I'm going to provide some context and introduction to the measures for assuring projects. I'm going to share a story about how it was created. And Hardy Elful, my colleague here, who is a cor corporate assurance manager for the West Midlands Combined Authority, the WMCA, will tell his great story of using the measures. But before we start, let's do the first poll. On the next slide, we have the questions, and Viva is going to launch the poll for all participants to respond to, please. 
Now, oh, basically, yeah, we're yeah. asking what your interest is in involvement is in project assurance. I'm sure everyone involved in projects had some angle on this, whether you you may not have been involved at all, That's, and then in which case you'll be learning about assurance from from start today. And just to know if you've been involved in a project which has been subject to assurance, you might be part of an assurance team, and you might even be a full time yeah. practitioner. And I believe, Viva, when you have results, you'll share yeah. them with us. Yes, uh, it's changing, but yeah, I've got uh, really good results. I've got 19% not involved, or 18% now, it changed to 18% not involved. 37% I have worked on project that has been subject to assurance. 33% I have been part of an assurance team. And 8% I am full-time assurance practitioner. Thanks so much. 58% have worked Great, so that gives me a good idea and hardly a good idea of the range of, of knowledge of the participants. And it's great to have a range of people who are from not involved to fully involved. I believe what we'll share with you today will be of interest to all of you. So moving on to the next slide. Yeah. This slide talks about what I think is a very good model for looking at assurance, and it's, it's described as the three lines of defence. I think that's on the previous slide, Eva. Yeah. Oh, it's a previous slide, yeah. We'll just pause for a minute as we go to the right slide. I think we have to go back a couple of slides. Yeah, this one. And the, the next slide should be the three lines of defense. Yeah, the lines of defense, sorry. And it is coming in, it's sort of fading in, and hopefully you can all see it now. Great. Simply put, the three lines are I describe them as follows. The first line on the left is controlled by self-assurance. The second line in the middle is compliance by assurance. And the third line is an independent review by external audit. One second, Tim. There we go. It's back. Right, we seem to have a, a disappearing slide. So I will repeat what I've said there. Three lines on oh, the three left. Lines of well, three lines of different my screen. Thank you. So I'll repeat what I said. So simply put, the first line on the left is controlled by self-assurance. In the middle, we have compliance by assurance. And, and third line, we have independent review by external audit. They all sort of work together, but with separate, different purposes. Now, my own recent experience working in government, I was a program and PMO director for a key agency in DEFRA. Now, we oh, were developing yeah. project governance plans and risk management for the EU exit project, something which is currently still ongoing. And we were subject to the three lines, and, they, 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 and we experienced them like this. So we were audited by KPMG. This was the third line of defence because they were looking at our project's scope in terms of delivering against a key risk, clearly EU exit or Brexit being a risk. Secondly, we were given a critical, critical friend review. I like that term, but that's a way to describe an external assurance. And we were reviewed by the individuals from the IPA, the Infrastructure Project Authority. So that was the second line. And thirdly, by way of self-assurance, we were developing governance and risk management processes with a risk register. And that was helping what I describe as the first line of assurance. So a very nice model way of looking at assurance holistically, and you can see which which angle you might be involved in or being experienced. So if you have any questions so far that have come up that you'd like to pick up for me. As I said, questions we can take as we go through or at the end. No questions at the moment. Okay, thank you. Well, let's move to our uh, next poll. Third line appropriate for SME, it says, 
one of the question is third line appropriate for SME? So SME, if you mean small Lowry. medium sized enterprise, I would say yes, if you've got uh, an auditor either appointed by your board or, or governance, that they may be looking at from a financial perspective, but they'll certainly be occasional, they'll come in and want to focus on particular risks. Not all projects would have be formally audited, but depending on the project, you may have specific risks which may affect the company which might be audited. So thank you for that question. And let's move on to the next slide, which has our second poll. Yes. Which is really focusing on just trying to understand if, if anyone in, in this particular audience has come across this document. It has been available within the APM community, the Associated Project Management community, for some time. So I wouldn't be surprised if we have, uh, might, we might not have, we have a number of people who are not familiar with it, but it's also good to know if, if there may be some who are familiar with it in terms of whether they may have seen the PDF document, maybe use it as a reference, which Hardy Al House is going to share that experience, and maybe whether, whether they might have used guidance. Yes, we got 52% voted for this, 86% I am not familiar with the guidance, 5% I have downloaded the PDF document, 5% okay. I have used the document as a reference, and 5% I have used the guidance to measure assurance. So 85% and then 5% each last three. Well, that's great. Well, I'm not surprised with that result, but I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in actually establishing con contacts with those who've used it as a reference or, or to measure assurance. So I'm happy to offline follow up with anyone who's interested in sharing what their, their experience of it in the way that Hardy is going to do. So moving to the next slide, which is really my opportunity to share oh, my story. Somebody said, sorry, still can't select poll. Uh, well, finished now, it's closed. Poll is finished now. Okay, so just to summarize. Okay, the next slide, okay. I'm not familiar with the guidance. So going back to the agenda. So my, my story of the creation of this document, go back a few years. And I was tasked with leading a group of seven very experienced assurance practitioners covering a wide range of industries. We were in a meeting room in the TFL, the Transport for London offices near St. James's Park, very grand offices. And from the window, we could actually see the park. I remember the lovely summer, spring day. And in the team were, in the room were an esteemed group of member of individuals. I can almost picture the room now. We had Andrew, who was working on the Crossrail project, Jeff from Transport for London, we had Kevin, who was working on the BAA Heathrow projects, General David, who was working on some quite sophisticated IT projects, we had John, who was working on government projects, and Philip, who was working on the London Olympics. And I was there representing BP with my experience of, of oil, gas, and petrochemical projects. I almost described that group as the Vindication 7. Well, when we were ready for battle, we were we had this challenge to look at doing some creating some measures for assuring projects, which was consensus across industries. So if you can picture the room, the energy in the room, the gravitas of experience, and we had this beautiful view, but we were focused. The good news, we have 200 years of experience we worked out in that room. Between seven this. The not so good news was when we noted our top, top criteria and shared them for, for assurance, they were all different. So what did I do? My heart sank. How on earth we were going to get a combined list and a common measure. But then I remembered my facilitation skills. And I took the pen, went up to the flip chart. There was certainly energy in the room. And I was confident there was desire to get alignment, to come up with some useful working consensus. And I proposed the first item on the list, scope development, and we were away. That item has become client and scope in the list I'll share with you in a minute. And by the end of the two hours we were there, we actually had a, a common list of criteria, 10 criteria. And we had, that's the list we have today, which is I'll show you in a minute. There was much more work to be done, fleshing out the criteria, establishing an evidence list, 
and the measures framework, which I'll also share with you. But at, at that meeting, we made a start. And for me, I think the power of the document is very much in the gravitas and the energy that's gone into it, particularly from that meeting forward. So moving on to the next slide. Which has the list of the key criteria. Now, Hardy, I'm going to suggest you and I turn our cameras off for this so that people can see a bit more of the screen. Yeah, we'll turn it off in a minute. If you could go back a slide, please. So we should be on the slide with the key criteria, which is coming back into view. I'm hoping you can read these. We'll come to the next slide in a minute. So it's based about, around these 10 criteria. Now the first one, client and scope, which I mentioned is where we started. In essence, this needs to be clear and complete. You need a sufficient definition, for example, function points, that's a good measure which could be used in the IT industry. And this is critical to set the project up for success. You then have risk and opportunities, risk, risk management throughout the project. You then have planning and scheduling, in essence, a resource loaded and integrated plan, as those are some of the key elements. Fourthly, you have organization capability and culture. This is where the project team comes in. This is another critical part of setting up a project for success, in my experience. You then have supply chain, procurement and logistics. And under six, you have the deliverables and benefits and outcomes, particularly for an IT or transformational projects. Seventh, you have finance, commercial and funds. Eighth, you have social responsibility and sustainability, which includes environmental impact and health and safety. Now, this is a list of criteria, and this for me, this one, certainly in the BP context, the high hazard environment, we, we, would, we, we have had and still have that as number one on the list. So health and safety, one of the key criteria at the top of the list for certain industries. The ninth one is performance, measurement and management action. And the tenth one is governance. Last but not least, it both underpins a project and is overarching and covering sponsors and stakeholders. In fact, this is something that quite often appears at the top of an auditor's list that I've come across. So I'll pause for a minute for me to see any questions have come up in the, in the, in the last couple of minutes. And, and if there's no Can question, everybody hear? Because uh, somebody said they can't hear uh, anything. If, if this going ahead, I cannot hear anything. So, but that was a long time ago. I'm hoping they can hear it now, hear you now. Okay. Well, if anyone's got any problems with, with okay. sound, please uh, okay. go into the chat. I'll assume that no questions so far. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. No, no question. Yeah. So this is... I've shown this not so we can read it in detail, but just to show you the essence of left hand side you have the 10 criteria and along the top you have the ratings and, and this is one of the key appendices in the document, it provides a 10 by 10 matrix. And I, what I want to do is share with you an example of how we used it or how I used it in a workshop at UCL, University College of London with Dr Andrew Edkins and it was with a group of his students on the Masters of Project Management course. And we used a case study of the Edinburgh Tram Project, a very famous project in terms of its ups and downs. And we set the, 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 the classroom to look at the assurance challenge around the point where the, the, the actual Edinburgh Tram Project was at the point of recovery. They had to stop the project in the middle of execution. And so what we did, we set up a couple of groups to take up roles for role play, project manager, assurer, technical lead, commercial lead. And we gave them a couple of hours to review the project and measure the assurance of the project using this matrix. Now, the good news and the real the test of success for this for us was that they found this very powerful, very helpful for them to look at assuring a, a case study or project in a particular position. And the results that came up across the different groups was very, very similar, apart from one area. And that was in the matter of risk management. 
So in the next slide, I'm going to sh show you a little bit of how the, how the matrix works. So if, maybe if you can move to the next slide, please. And the next slide shows it drills into one area of this matrix around risks. And what we found was that one of the groups assessed the risk management of the, of the case study in the project as good. Another group assessed it as poor. And what was interesting to, to understand why there was that difference, because quite a significant difference. And actually one of the groups had come to the view that because risk management would be poor in the past, therefore the assessment should be poor. And the other group said, well, because risk management is set up for success in the future, it should be acceptable. And this is interesting. This is where judgment and assurance comes in. And for me, it's a good example of the art of doing assurance in addition to the science of evidence. So there's two, there's the, I'll repeat that. It's an example of the art of doing assurance in addition to the science of evidence. It, it's, it requires judgment. So we can move on a couple of slides, please be back, because that completes my stories, my input to the session. I'll put my camera up again. And the example we're going to move on to in a minute will be shared by Hardial Fool, who's a corporate assurance manager from the West Midlands Combined Authority. Now, this is one of the best examples I've come across of the practical use of the measures for project assurance. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what Hardial has to say. Now, by way of introduction, Hardial has a background in project management and IT projects in various sectors, including banking, infrastructure, and the NHS. And he started his role with the WMCA in 2018. And as well as assurance, he covers risk management, auditing, and reporting. So, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hardial, and I'll give you a virtual handshake, safe handshake, and hand over. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's well. <clears throat> um, could we have the next slide, please, Viva? <clears throat> Me is w w M C A. who we are and what we do. Is that what you want? Yes, please. That That is what I got in front of the screen. I can't see it in front of me. Oh, gosh. What has happened then? The slide that I can see is the 10 by 10 matrix. I got WBMCA on mine. I, I still can't see it, Viva. There we go. It's just, it's just popped up. Can you see it now? I can. Thank you. Can you see it now? So, hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm here today to. Um, Apologise. That's okay. To just talk through um, with you some of what um, I've learned in the Westminster Combined Authority um, by way of practical application of the toolkit. So uh, before I get into that, I thought I'd just give you a bit of context for the organisation itself. So the West Midlands Combined Authority is a, um, a mayoral combined authority that was formed in 2016 um, from a former transport um, authority. Um, we are involved in lots of different types of projects all across the region, the West Midlands region. Um, so we are involved in traditional transport infrastructure type schemes um, that range across the different modes of transport. So it could be uh, rail stations um, uh, and, and, and basically the recommissioning of what used to be redundant rail stations <clears throat> all the way through to uh, buses, um, trams and then more recently um, healthier modes of transport, things that are more green, so things like cycle lanes, um, right the way through to um, energy innovation um, investment proposals, as an example. Um, 
There was one proposal last year which looked at uh, exploiting a geothermal uh, spa reservoir in the Solihull locality or borough um, with the intention of um, using that thermal energy to generate electricity um, to sell back to the grid um, to offset investment within the Solihull locality in town centre right the way through to um, investments around strategic land acquisition um, where there have been instances of market failure for the purposes of remediating that land um, so that it's um, so that there's appetite in the marketplace to develop on that land for commercial or residential purposes um, so just as, as an example as you can see in that pie chart just in the middle there's a single program of investment which um, is up to the value of around eight billion pounds over the course of the next 30 years and i guess the key point that i want to illustrate here is that as an organization we have our fingers in lots of different pies where we're, we're involved in so many different projects um you know as i mentioned just before there's traditional infrastructure type projects right the way through to highly innovative type schemes um including things like 5g which you might have heard is being piloted within of the region so if we could move on to the next slide please Viva. Viva. thank you see the screen i can i can i can see it up on screen thank you um, so one of the things that I just wanted to talk about with you all is, um, is, is what our journey has been like in um, the practical application of the toolkit that Tim just talked through. Um, so some of the challenges that we've encountered as an assurance function, um, and we're a very small function, by the way. Um, so there's, I think, within the whole of corporate assurance, uh, around six people, um, and that's covering kind of program assurance as well as business assurance type activities so some of the challenges that we are facing at the moment is that there's a new way of working um, corporate assurance is transitioning into a strategic hub um, as a centralized function within of our organization um, so that we have a very holistic view for all of the different initiatives that have been progressed across the organization so if you can imagine that there are different portfolios, housing and regeneration, for instance, through to transport, through to skills and productivity, there are a number of projects within of each of those portfolios that differ quite significantly. And one of the key drivers behind this strategic hub that we are transitioning into is to basically um, understand what the aggregated effect of all of these projects programs are um, to the region that we serve. So it's a piece of work that I'm involved in right now, very challenging. Um, one of the next challenges that we're experiencing, and some of you might be able to relate to this um, from what we've seen on the poll, is that there's a limited understanding inside of the organization for what program assurance is, um, you know, within of an integrated assurance, three lines of defense type model. Um, one of our biggest challenges, I think, is that there are portfolios across the organization that are maturing at different paces, um, which links to my next point, um, which is that there are inconsistent project and program management practices and standards. So varying methods that exist across the portfolios um, and some fragmented approaches to delivering projects. Um, one of the other challenges that we face is that our governance arrangements provide fairly limited opportunities uh, for formal assurance reporting um, and therefore you know our ability to demonstrate what our value add is um, and historically um, as the organization's evolving so you know I mentioned before that we're a fairly new organization we've been in existence since 2016 and we've really ramped up with our agenda across the whole of the region um, is that historically um, projects were very much gateway driven so stage by stage by stage um, where there was evidence of good practice um, we have very limited team resources um, and there's um, an unreliable sometimes unknown and um, to put it politely a dynamic pipeline of projects 
So one of our key challenges is essentially having visibility for all of the different initiatives that are taking place across the organization uh, for the purposes of giving the organization comfort and confidence on the performance of those initiatives um, outside, of course, of the, the immediate delivery structure. So if I could please have the next slide, Viva. James did. Thank you. So I just wanted to give a little bit of context or rationale for why the measuring um, measures for, for a shoring projects toolkit. One, one, of, one of the challenges that I noticed when I first commenced in post around February 18 is that the assurance specialists would you know, undertake assurance reviews um, and activity um, with a whole host of observations and make a series of recommendations but they those recommendations and observations weren't taken very seriously by the organization so one of one of the drivers for looking to the toolkit was the credibility um, that was offered in pointing back to and referring to an established association for project management toolkit so where there were different project management practices um, and capabilities scattered across the organization you know, in, in our ability to point back to use of the toolkit, it gave us a bit more credibility. People tended to listen a bit more, um, you know, very simply in that it demonstrated that we didn't just make things up. Um, so one of the other reasons as to why I, um, you know, move forward at pace with the APM toolkit is that it really helped to raise our profile and to move away from some of the negative perceptions. So there, and, and again, some of you might, might be able to relate to this, but there were some perceptions in our organization that, you know, we as an assurance function were very much a policing type function, um, where what I, what I wanted to do is to shift um, that perception in that, you know, we would work collaboratively with our stakeholders and project teams. If I could just have, there we go, thank you. Um, work collaboratively with our stakeholders and with our teams to try to change that negative perception. And again, you know, use of an established APM toolkit helped us to achieve that. So another key driver for use of the APM toolkit is um, to illustrate the added value of assurance activities by, and these are quite important, I think, um, in encouraging uniformity across projects um, with consistent approaches um, applied uh, across the different portfolios. And what I mean by that is that where assurance reviews uh, were undertaken and where there were observations, we would sometimes find um, evidence for really good practice in certain portfolio areas um, and try to break down silos by pointing portfolio areas or project teams in portfolios to other areas of the organization. Um, so not to recreate the wheel, as it were. Um, the next point is around <clears throat> having reviews that are intended to be relative to life cycle stages and also driven by um, the level of risk or complexity of the project and just as an example the categories the measures the evidence that we would look at um, in you know providing assurance or undertaking a formal assurance review would need to be relative to where a project is in its life cycle for example, at the very earlier stages of a project life cycle kind of you know, definition or even concept, shall we say, it wouldn't be appropriate necessarily to consider some of the supply chain um, areas that you would consider. So it's just being kind of proportionate and relative with the assessments that were undertaken against where a project was in its life cycle. And, and that was another really key way that we were able to sell use of <clears throat> the toolkit and the assurance reviews. And then secondly, when I talk about risk-based or complexity driven, we developed a separate matrix, which I've not included in this slide deck, um, but what that enabled us to do was essentially really focus on um, the projects that were of the highest profile. And what I mean by profile is against a rounded set of 10 factors. So it could have been that we were assessing projects for instance, based on 
their value based on reputational impact should something go wrong based on um, interdependencies so a whole series of factors um, and the intention here was that the assurance activity that is undertaken is proportionate to the level of risk or complexity of the project on to my next point um, we wanted to use the toolkit really to help in a way to improve project management standards so i mentioned before that you know there were fragmented approaches um, across the whole organization and the toolkit helped us to really draw that out in an evidence in an evidence-based way um, and as i mentioned just before really look to share where there were examples of good practice um, and then finally um, facilitate a proactive approach in identifying assessing and mitigating project risks so this goes back to one of my earlier points about um, historically how um, assurance activity <clears throat> was very much driven by gateways um, as a project progressed through its life cycle what we wanted to do was to, sh to move our focus a little bit away from that and um, be a little bit more involved with project teams still maintaining the independence but giving the feedback that project teams needed to optimize performance before reaching a gateway for instance um, to give it the best possible chance for authority to progress to the next stage in its life cycle um, one of my other points here is that in our experience um, historically um, assurance reviews and observations contained a series of recommendations um, so a load of narrative basically um, and it was my intention to make that a little more punchy um, and you know having done some testing and experimentation with an array of stakeholders a numeric output proved um, the most effective way to get a message across um, and you'll see a little bit more about this just in a short while um, and then finally um, we used the toolkit because of the ability that we had to mechanize the way that it worked um, it enabled flexibility enriched analysis and better reporting so when I say mechanized, you'll see a little bit more about what I mean by that in a future slide, but just referencing what Tim showed you just before in his 10 by 10 matrix, there are 10, 10 categories. Um, within of those 10 categories, there were a series of measures. Underneath each of those measures, there's a whole host of an evidence basis that you would look for um, to demonstrate you know, whether um, X, Y, or Z is in place or not. Uh, and, and really by breaking all of that down we were able to mechanize the toolkit quite heavily which then you know enable flexibility and enriched analysis and much better reporting capabilities so viva unless anyone has any questions at this point could we move to the next slide well the question is will will the slide decks use be available after the session and i yes the slides will be available they will be sent out tomorrow or the following within the next couple of days. So that's the answer. Okay, I'll do the next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> so what you guys are looking at just here is just a snapshot view, an illustration of uh, the scoring sheet that the assurance specialists would use um in uh, undertaking an assurance review um so you know i can see that there's, there's no header just to the left hand side where there's the vertical orange box but just structurally the way that i wanted to try to explain this <clears throat> is that this is the master scoring sheet that the assurance specialist would use so where you see 1.1 and 1.2 and then the subsection 1.1.1 and 1.1.2 and so on the 1.1 relates to a subsection of the categories that Tim talked through. And you know, for those of you that have downloaded the guidance, this might make a little more sense. And for those of you that will download the guidance, you know, I'm, I'm sure it will make sense when you look at it. So what, what we did is uh, adapt the toolkit slightly. Um, and this is what I mean by mechanizing it, such that there were specific lines of inquiry for each of the categories. 
and each of the subsections in a single category. Um, and you'll see from some of the detail that you see there, we try to outline quite clearly what the requirement is in terms of the line of inquiry. So, you know, with the top one, for example, project objectives are clear and unambiguous in smart format, um, and potentially that the evidence for that would be the business case. The next column along from that uh, contains a drop down which will have either a yes, a no, a not applicable, or partial. And the partial bit ties a little bit back to what Tim was talking about in regards to um, making a bit of a judgment call. Um, the next column along from that, the complexity column, um, points back to what I was talking about earlier, which was that our list of or our lines of inquiry we would flex um, relative to what we would assess the complexity of a project to be. So very simply, if, if a project was highly complicated, major interdependencies, very high value, significant potential for reputational damage, for example, the uh, complexity rating that we give it is red. And what that means uh, essentially is that the full extent of our lines of inquiry um, are available um, and are required to be um, assessed. So the assurance specialist would take each of these lines of inquiry and then look to see whether there is evidence in place to satisfy that line of inquiry. And one other thing is that you'll see that there's a not applicable. Um, this relates back to two points. Um, one is how varied projects and programs are. So there may be some lines of inquiry inside the toolkit that don't apply to every project. So in that type of scenario, we have the ability to um, blank it out through a not applicable. Um, and that um, has been designed with formulas in the background to be reflected in the scoring that, that um, is given for that particular uh, line of inquiry. Um, and the other scenario is the one that I described, which is where for certain categories like solution, for instance, um, it may not be appropriate to assess um, against lines of inquiry if a project is very early on in its life cycle. Um, and then just to the right hand side, you'll see that depending upon what the response is that's been selected, whether that's a yes, a no, or not applicable, or partial even, the formulas in the background will um, come up with a percentage score. So unless there are any questions on that slide, FIBA, could we please go to the next? Great, great, thank you. Um, so what you are seeing here is a, um, a category score summary sheet. Again, just an illustration. Um, for um, the definitions um, and the scoring um, for an individual category. And in the example that you see here, it's the client and scope category. And the reason that's why I've included this is that you can see just to the right hand side, based on the previous scoring sheet, we assessed this category in particular client and scope with all of the lines of inquiry as being 46%. This Illustration here is intended to be shared with um, people like project sponsors, uh, senior responsible owners, those types of people, um, even project managers, um, to essentially make sense of what the numeric output is, so that people and you know our stakeholders and audience were able to see um, to see what it meant to um, you know receive a score of say 46% against something that's called 75%. So there's a range that you see just to the left there from red um, all the way up to best in breed. So I think that that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, and unless there are any questions on that, could we please move to the next slide? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions on this one. So I'll move to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, um, again, what you're seeing in front of you is just, um, it's an overall school summary. It's just an illustration based on the previous two slides that you'll have seen. So there's the individual lines of inquiry that are set up 
um, to be representative of each of the categories. Then there's a category summary, which gives a little bit more meaning to what the percentages are, um, the 46%, the 33%. And then more holistically, um, you can have a look to see across all 10 of the categories, how the project has scored in its assurance assessment with an overall score at the bottom. And some of the feedback that we've had so far is that stakeholders really quite like it. So I mentioned before that the numeric output's quite punchy. With the slide that preceded this one, for individual categories, stakeholders are able to see kind of where or whereabouts they are. So that gives a bit of meaning to the numeric output. Um, and in terms of the overall school, um, we have recognised as a small kind of working group um, that, that I'm part of with Tim, that there's a little bit more work that we need to do in relation to giving some more meaning to the overall numeric score or, or, or the overall RAG rating for the project. In addition to that, just, just a note of caution um, with the way that we have used each of these categories is that we have them equally weighted um, with the overall score averaged out. So that's all about I intended to cover for that slide. Unless there are any questions on that in particular, could we move to the next one, please, Viva? While we're wait waiting for Viva, perhaps we could go over one or two of the questions that are outstanding. Hardil? Yeah, please. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, okay. I was on, on mute. What range of overall scores have, have you seen in practice? Yeah, hang on. We've got some earlier questions. Can we deal with those first? One of them is, uh, think... how did you tackle the lack of project management best practice? Is there a PMO office to back up with training? Um, there, there, we do have a centralised program management office function. Um, and there were processes that are in place, um, and there are, you know, there's a methodology that exists, um, along with, you know, a plethora of templates to be used across the organisation. Um, our challenge, from an assurance perspective, was the um, engagement of the business with our centralised PMO. So, as an assurance function, we sat independently to the PMO as well as to the um, portfolios. Um, and because the portfolios didn't engage all of the time with our PMO, we started to notice that there were quite fragmented approaches um, to project management across the whole of the organization. So not in the way that we would expect, um, you know, um, not, not in the way that we would expect the standards to be um, and use of templates. And the other challenge is that with the, with the environment and our type of organization i mentioned before how diverse we are in the types of projects that we deliver um, individual portfolios would often outsource um, delivery um, to consultancies <clears throat> or other organizations or it would be that we would work in partnership with other organizations and of course you know inevitably there would be um, a difference in the standards that were used so so that paints the picture about you know where we are in terms of maturity as an organization in terms of what we did what we were able to do using the high using the toolkit is to is to highlight that there were practices that were very different across the organization um, and i mentioned just before um, that wherever we saw examples of good practice we'd look to try to replicate that by point signposting um, portfolio areas or localized project teams in portfolios um, to just check in with another area um, you know, that's, that's utilising um, templates or following processes in the right way. Um, and then similarly, you know, we'd feed back to the PMO as well in that, you know, PMO would be a good idea to try to re-engage this area of the organisation. So slightly long-winded, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, There's thanks. another question here. Has this been used in Agile Lean programmes? That is Lean Business Change and Agile Development. Um, in, in my experience of the, uh, the organisation that I'm in, we are not using it, strictly speaking, in that way. We've adapted it um, to be a little bit more responsive to IT projects, and that's the beauty of the toolkit. 
with the specific evidence sought is that you do have the flexibility to bolster it. So we have done that. In one of my previous slides, I showed you probably two to five percent of the total lines of inquiry. Um, so not so much at this point in time. But I think Tim, you and I spoke about this. And there might be yes. something that you wanted to see. Yes, and the, the uh, general called Mark Bruce Kingsmill, who I presented on this subject before, actually up in Scotland, he his worked example was with an organization called LADOS, and they are the IT project supplier to the Cross government. And they their their example, their story of using the assurance guidance and toolkit here is was actually for the program which embodied agile and agile approach. And they used exactly what Hardiel shared here. Plus, they actually added a what I would describe as a technical dimension. They added a, a sort of framework which covered what I, the technical aspects of Agile, for example, around things like documentation. And they applied both of those in parallel. So the answer is yes. And that, there's a great, great example which we've uh, talked about before. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. And I think, Viva, you said that there was a question on the range of scoring that we've been used to seeing. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, the range of scoring that we've been used to seeing, I, I, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Um, there are some really good examples um, out there in our organisation. So some projects, you know, are hitting that 75, 80% a kind of level of assessment, whereas other areas of the organisation are not really anywhere near that. So the range is anywhere from between kind of, you know, 15, 20 percent all the way up to 75, 80 percent at most. But we have a little bit more work to do as an organisation. Is the a AFMP template available as spreadsheets? You know, there was a spreadsheet earlier. Currently, I don't believe that it is. I think, and Tim, correct me if I'm mistaken, I think it's available just as a PDF formatted download. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. There is a crude spreadsheet which um, it isn't. It sort of offered as part of that, but there, there's a spreadsheet available. But that's that's fairly fairly basic. But in terms of follow up, if anyone's interested in that, once they've seen the actual toolkit, then I'd be happy to um, talk more about that. Brilliant, thank you. So, Viva, unless there are any other questions, could we there please is, move? Yeah, there, yeah. In the example on screen, how can scope and risk be low and high score on planning and scheduling? Yeah, it's 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 something that I should have probably paid a bit more attention to. Apologies. It was probably me messing around with the template um, and with the way that I cropped it. So our default um, version one of the template starts with everything zeroed out. And the likelihood is that I've just gone through and selected um, different entries just to illustrate the movement in the scoring. So that's the rationale for that. Don't, don't, don't take it as an accurate representation of an assessment for a project. Uh, well, I can't see any other questions unless David or... Yeah. Or there are, see any there are. Sure. Um, I think there are one or two. Let's have a look. Um, how difficult was it to move measurements away from the triangle of cost, time and quality, with quality always the poor third? Nice one. Um, in, in my experience in the organisation, um, not too difficult. And, um, you know, to, 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 to simplify, um, the reason for that, I think, is our, just our, our general level of project program management capability in certain areas of the organisation. So where we have experience in using this toolkit, 
um, stakeholders that we're working with have taken to the categories and the measures and the specific lines of inquiry quite well. Um, so I've not really encountered that as much of a challenge in, in use of the toolkit. Not to say that we won't, um, but that's about where we are at this point in time. Mm. Thanks. Uh, one one question here: Do you drill down across the ranges on what the root causes are in the portfolio? Do we drill down across the ranges? Could could you just repeat that question, please, David? Yeah. Well, I'm just uh, reading it verbatim here. Do you drill down across the ranges on what the root causes are in the portfolio? Uh, so if 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 um. If, if I can try to interpret that, and, and whoever's asked the question, please, you know, um, just correct me if I've interpreted it incorrectly. So, so what in, in, in mechanising this toolkit, one of the things that um, we really pushed for as a team is um, is that trend analysis type capability, and with the way that we have individual lines of inquiry with um, subsections in individual categories. We have quite a, a rich um, analytical and reporting capability. So, yeah, in splitting um, assurance reviews up across the different portfolios, we have quite a granular ability to, uh, to pinpoint and identify where certain portfolios aren't or, or are consistently getting things wrong or missing things. Uh, and similarly, where certain portfolios are doing things really, really well. So I hope that that answers the question, but you know, please do say if I've misinterpreted. Yeah, it seems to be about drilling down in, into the detail, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah I've, um, it's Stephen another one. Ross, who asked the question, says that that's, that's fine. He's fine with what you said. Um, another question. Oh, go on, David. Um, is there a correlation between projects that score quite low on the scoring matrix yeah. and those projects that struggle to deliver and achieve their objectives? Yeah, yes, in, 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 in our experience, yes, we, we, we are finding that. Um, and, and, and I guess just at a high level, simply because I think what we are finding um, is that projects aren't matured sufficiently so you know a lot of the detail that you'd expect to be in place by way of objectives and acceptance success criteria that type of um, level of information is isn't at the earlier stages in the project life cycle matured to, to, to that level of granular detail um, so when it comes to delivery it makes it a little more difficult to assess whether the project has achieved what it was set out to achieve. So I'm not sure that I have answered that question. Maybe what we can ask people to do is if they feel that they, they haven't had an answer to a question yet, or there's some variation on it, that they submit another question, because we will ask you to, you know, at the end of this, um, um, to answer any other questions. Um, and then we'll forward them on to people. If that's yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, question just come in. What project management framework do you use? E.g., Prince, Scrum, etc. Um, the historically the framework that was in place at the organisation was an iteration, be the best word, uh, of Prince. Um, I mentioned just before that you know a really big piece of work that I'm involved in at the moment is transitioning to strategic hub, so that enables us the oversight and to get an aggregated picture. But what we're also doing as an organisation is putting into place um, what we're referring to as a single assurance framework, and as part of that framework, we are um, trying to develop, um, which we're making really good progress with, and embed. Uh, standardised um, approaches to um, initiation, development, approval dates, um, and delivery stages of life cycle. So moving forward, I'm expecting um, an improvement, but at the moment, an iteration of uh, prints, although there are some examples of other life cycles like um, 
use of rebar, use of grip for rail type schemes, um, and even instances of um, agile methodology. Yeah, so you're looking to dovetail in, aren't you? You dovetail them into the, you know, the methodology um, that's available um, and hopefully look for the hooks into it. That, 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 that's right, yeah. Um, and with the way that we've established the toolkit, we so we've bolstered um, some of the specific lines of inquiry in line with the different kind of methods that are out there. And what we've also done is built into the specific lines of inquiry the the option of not applicable where you know there is a, a a difference from one type of project to the next right do you want to move on is, there's another slide there's yeah? another question here i don't know whether it's been answered how difficult was it to move measurements away from the triangle of cost time yeah, just, quality yeah, and uh, always the poor third yeah, we had a quick answer to that one. Yeah. Oh, we had that. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, then shall I go on the next slide? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I think I've alluded to this before. Um, and again, what, what you're seeing here, uh, apologies, you'll have to excuse the uh, presentation. On my screen, the screen it's kind of stretched apart and condensed in certain areas. But what you see in front of you is just a summary, um, a summary um, of how projects are um, scoring, performing in each of their categories, um, each of the ten categories. Um, so it enables. I think one of the questions was interrogating um, kind of performance or lines of inquiry assurance assessments by portfolio. This illustration is intended just to summarise some of what's going on in portfolio areas. So it's, it's, it's very simple in the way that it's um, made up. Um, and I, I don't have anything more to add on to that. So unless anyone has any questions, other than to say, um, one thing that we recognise is that with the way that we're using the toolkit, we're learning all the time. Um, there's still, you know, there's there's a whole list of items on our development log, um, and I mentioned that I'm involved with Tim Podesta um, and a few others uh, looking to refresh the toolkit. But just to say that where we have at the bottom the scores representative of um, the individual categories, just as it says, it's an average scoring. So it's just rolled up. Right, we've got a couple of uh, questions that we can probably slip in here. What software do you use for managing projects, e.g. MS projects, project online, etc.? We, as an organisation, use um, Microsoft Project for, for the purposes of scheduling. We have solutions in place like um, ProjectWise. I'm not sure whether, any, whether anyone's heard of that. Smartsheets is also in existence. And we're using currently some functionality within a uh, Microsoft SharePoint. So there's quite a mixture of um, software solutions that are in place across the organization for different purposes. So I hope that that answers the question. And did you say yeah. there's a second question, David? A couple more here. Does your yeah. assurance department have authority to drive the best practice? <laughs> Uh, we, I, I wouldn't say that we have formal authority. Um, we don't have formal authority with a um, proportion of projects, um, uh, but it's our, you know, it's it's it, it's what we aspire to try to do um, to share best practice, to break down um, um, silos and siloed activity, um, and look for opportunities to drive. Um, in a performance and optimization of performance. Yeah, a good question here. How often do you execute the toolkit for each project? Is it weekly, monthly, or you know, daily, or you know, when you have an issue? How do you how do you go about that? 
Okay, so at this point in time, <clears throat> when we first started to use the toolkit, and that was with a, a test sample of project, so probably from last summer, it was our intention to use the toolkit on a monthly basis. On a monthly basis, and with the way that we've structured it, um, and what I've just shown you, um, our thinking was that there'd be an initial assessment, which would give us um, you know, um, a scoring for each of the categories, um, and we'd also get a picture, a position for whether evidence existed for the each, sorry, for the lines of inquiry. With the way that we're using the toolkit, we have an ability um, for future assessments just to focus on um, where project teams um, have not um, been able to respond to the requirement. So, just as an example, you know, if, if, if the list had um, circa 100 lines of inquiry, um, we'd have um, a scoring for each of those 100 lines of inquiry um, at our first health check of the project. The second health check, which initially started a, you know, a month later, might only have focused on a third of that, so I don't know, 25 to 30 lines of inquiry, dependent upon whether we found that there was evidence in place based on that first assessment. So initially we started off at monthly type assessments, um, recognising that the level of effort required for subsequent assessments was a bit less. Um, but we're thinking now as part of our move to the strategic hub about how to use the toolkit in a slightly different way. Um, picking up on the point that I think someone raised around <clears throat> when triggered. So, you know, in a scenario where a project is in breach of its control tolerances or is in close proximity on a cumulative basis to breaching its control tolerances might be a, a point in time at which we subject the project to a health check. So I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, I would have thought that um, you would tend to focus on the red areas uh, because they are the ones. Hopefully, you're 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 looking for get well plans and and this sort of thing, and therefore want to review those on a more regular basis. Yeah, yeah. And some of the thinking with the toolkit is that there there, there would there would be a priority for um, areas um, <clears throat> for areas to improve and it, it's exactly as you've said David so it's not illustrated I think in the scoring sheet and it could be something that I think we need to bolt into it but I know for sure that it's on our development log but it's exactly as you've said um, is to focus our attention to you know schools that are of x and below or at red rating yeah yeah that, that makes sense doesn't it yeah um, do you need to move on um, to the next slide or? Yes, please. Okay, yeah. Well, well I think here it... we are. <laughs> yes, and I think this is where I come back on the stage. So, Hardio, thank you for um, the no problem. We've got some more time for questions. And I, I personally am very much looking forward to, well, I, I, learned, I learned a lot from that myself particularly how you're using it across the portfolio and I look forward to hearing maybe six months and a year's time how it's how, what more you've learned from working across the portfolio but I do have a question and you talked earlier on about being seen as a policeman and I think you did mention the word critical friend I feel that's, that's a journey from being a policeman to a critical friend where are you on that journey do you think and how is the is it, is it tool how is that helping with it or not I think I think that we are seen as more of a critical friend now um, than than we were um, before as, as as police, and I, I think the reason for that is that a lot of our effort in application of the toolkit ties back to one of the points I made, which was to try to be proactive in engaging with the project teams. So rather than rather than undertake an assessment to complement, for example. Um, to, rather than undertake an assessment to inform the decision as to whether the project moves forward to the next stage gate, what we try to do is to work with the project teams initially to get them to a point where it was safe for them to move to the next control gate. 
So in, in, in a fashion, that decision should always be a yes, move forward if we're doing what we need to do effectively. And I think that helps shift a bit of the mindset that we're not there you know, to police, um, but we're there to look to optimise performance where necessary. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's great news. And I'm pleased to hear that, that the tools help with that. So Weber, David, what other questions do we have, please? Well, we've got um, one. Um, so, shall I ask yeah. it from Ian? Yeah. Okay. Larry. Yeah. I'm uh, yeah. I'm sold on the use of this assurance measurement approach. Good, and I look forward to try in my next role. And he says, in my experience, I've had CEOs who are only interested in cost, and is the project on time? These are new product development uh, projects with market launch date. Um, any advice on that? That they that they seem to be sort of hell bent just on a couple of um, factors here. Uh, should 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 I try and go for that, Tim? Please, yes. yes. Um, so so we have, um, and I think there was you know there was a question earlier on about how we have shifted from um, a focus on time cost quality type factors to you know the ten that you you've seen in the toolkit. Um, and, you know, in our experience, the organisation and stakeholders have been quite receptive to that um, in that, you know, it, it's been our intention and all of our effort has been on conveying the importance of, of each of those factors as well. So you know, traditionally in project management, people might you know, have that mindset of time, cost, quality type factors, um, but we're having some success. Um, some, you know, some good success with stakeholders that we're working with. And I guess it ties back to one of the earlier points and questions around how we are able to and what we are doing to um, improve standards. I think this toolkit has been really helpful in providing a bit of the education piece. So that's kind of, I think, what I'd say for that. We, we've had success. And, and I'd add to that from when I think back to the Magnificent Seven that I mentioned who were behind the original creation of this document, they were clearly experienced practitioners in the matter of confidence in project success. And success, I can think of everyone in that room, success for them would have been not just cost schedule, but actual the, the outcome of the projects. When you think of the projects that they, would have, they were working on, um, the, the benefits, the operability, the operating performance are all quality, were all part of what they would see as, as a successful projects. So I, I think uh, holistically within this approach, it covers uh, it should cover all of that if it's applied. Um, if it's applied, it's thought, with judgment. Thanks. Uh, next question: Was the toolkit approach useful in getting stakeholders to focus on reviewing the business case? Was still relevant? especially with project overruns in time or budget yeah absolutely um so you know there are specific <clears throat> excuse me there are specific lines of inquiry um within of that scoring sheet that seek um revalidation um for instance of elements that would be contained in the business case so i think it really brought back the focus to stakeholders that we've worked with so you know there needs to be the ongoing justification um, and you know ongoing review of the business case so i think it just brought it back so where where you know and a lot of you may have experience of this a business case is approved and it kind of gets locked away in a cupboard and is never seen again um a lot of the lines of inquiry and a lot of the questions that we were asking as well as a lot of the evidence that we were seeking um in those lines of inquiries points back to the business case. So it just brought it back to the forefront of people's minds. Yes, it looks like it's, it's sort of a living document. And if things look as though they, they might impact on the business case, then obviously you've got to start looking at them in, in more detail. Yeah. 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 Mm. And the key is that is the engagement with the key stakeholders. Um, in, in the latest example I referred to earlier, Scottish government, uh, one of the key um, proponents of having used this approach was the SRO, the Senior Responsible Officer, who actually came to a couple of conferences and then spoke 
very powerfully about the, the value of doing this approach. And because he saw value in it, in the conversations that he helped him have with the project, the key project for the government, to do with document management and workflow and handling um, inquiries. And, and then he said, well, as well as um, those conversations, it gave him confidence, it gave him some um, evidence and material that he could talk to his stakeholders as well. Yeah. Right, the next one is relating to OGC's list of common causes of failure. Um, and, uh, and the questioner says he's found it helpful. Um, and what are your feelings on, on the OGC list? Have, have you sort of taken that into account in developing your model, for instance? Um, we're, we're aware of the OGC list, um, and I think publication um, publication from the Infrastructure Projects Authority on, on common causes of project failure. So we are we are aware of them, um, and it, I, I can't say that we directly reconciled the tool uh, and our lines of inquiry with those um, with those common causes of failure. But the team collectively had a look through, um, and I, I, you know I'm fairly confident that it does pick up on. Um, those common um, areas and causes of failure, because when I when I had a look through, frankly, I thought that the causes of failure were a lot of the obvious things, a lot, a lot of the foundation level um, things that were often overlooked or you know um, were not revalidated on an ongoing basis. Um, so I hope that that answers it. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that um, somewhere in your you know list of metrics, um, you're covering off all their things because, as you say, most of them are uh, are obvious once you know about them. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. when we put the document together in the first instance, we we had a number of references and also the experience that people brought allowed us to take that into account. What we yeah, twice to. Um, going forward we are looking at a refresh of this document yeah. we recognize it's, it's still part of the projects and the refresh is identified a couple of things we want to update it to take account of some of the the, the newer thinking like the, the, the five dimensions that's come out of the green it's called the green book of it yeah so whilst we're not in the we recognize that this document has power across different sectors we are trying to reflect more recent thinking in the sort of government circles as part of that. Well, of, of course, the other area that um, we get a lot of good advice from is the National Audit Office, you know, and their their review of major projects um, also has a checklist of all sorts of things. And it's just a matter of making sure they're all somehow dovetailed into into your your process. Um, I've got another question here. Has this framework been tested against small and very rapid delivery projects? Um, when we say s smaller and, and, and rapid delivery type projects, um, I'm just trying to rack my brain thinking of examples. Um, well, is it all, you know, do you want a massive framework for something that's small and don't take long, for instance? Yeah. The, 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 so the toolkit has built into it with the way that we are using it, the bit about complexity. So that takes into account, you know, as I said, a number of factors, these 10 factors. Um, it doesn't take into account um, duration, overall duration. So we don't flex our lines of inquiry within the toolkit um, based on the need to deliver by um, within a certain window. So that's not something that, that that we've thought of just yet, but it would be a good one for us to think about for sure on on our devlog. Yeah. Mm. Um, the example I gave earlier around the Scottish government laid us that was used in an agile context. So there was rapid delivery in the sense of uh, sprints and release candidates. It was a uh, depending on the importance of the project. I would say this could be a useful checklist in the setup of a project. Yeah. You probably wouldn't have time to assure it as you go through, but at least it would help you uh, set up success. Yeah, well, as a project manager, 
um, you, you want to know where all the red, amber, greens are so that you can make sure that you get rid of all the reds as soon as possible, yeah? Um, I, I, I set up a sort of um, a traffic light monitoring system, oh, probably about 20 odd years ago now it was. Um, it was based on um, the checklist we used to use when we decided as a systems integrator whether to bid for a project or not. Because when we looked at it, we we looked at what the risks of actually doing the job were before you actually signed a contract. And based on that that sort of thinking, um, got a checklist together. So I've always found um, these sort of traffic light things really helpful. It helps you focus, doesn't it? Yeah. I've got a question here um, to do with follow-up. Um, if we've got, if um, viewers have any queries, um, you know, for follow-up later, um, how can is there a point of contact or um, presumably they go to the APM site, do they, to check up on things, or do they come direct to you, Tim? Tim, you've gone offline. You're you're mute. I'd, I'd say uh, maybe speak for Hardy as well, but I'd, I'd be happy to contact you directly with any specific questions. Um, right. the APM symbols can check. There are other resources associated to assurance through the APM website. All right. Are your contact details on the on the slide pack or not? I can't remember. If not, um, how happy for them to go in the follow up that Viva sent out. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I can't see any other questions just at the moment, apart okay. from those that we've got to answer. Yeah, and I think we're just about coming up to the last few minutes. It's always good to um, yeah. do a bit of wrap up. I do have one final question for Hardhill myself. And in terms of dealing with these challenging times at the moment, and, and obviously the response to COVID and restrictions to travel and, and, and so forth, how has that affected your assurance activity? And and in fact, have you had to do any of these reviews virtually? And how has that worked? Yeah, that's a good question, Tim. Um, so we are noticing a uh, a wind down in a lot of the traditional kind of construction or infrastructure type type projects is what we've noticed um just just just, just across the board um that that's one thing that we've noticed for sure how we are how we are conducting the reviews is in the same way um so we're using the toolkit um wherever we can with those projects um, as they are progressing. Um, and in, in, in terms of um, assessing these projects or assuring these projects, um, recognising the impact of <clears throat> the pandemic that we're in the middle of, um, what we've also tried to do is to water down some criteria um, for use within of our strategy directorate. So our strategy and economy directorate have a series of lines of inquiry um, that are all aimed to um, assess the project as part of our um, economic recovery type plan for the region. So there's there's things that we have drawn out of the toolkit um, for that reason. Okay, great. Um, well, I'd like to thank Hardy and myself for, for for your contribution and uh, and and ask APM members who may be on this session to look out for news of the refresh that's currently going on. And I'd like to, let's hand back to our good friends, David and Viva, the BCS, for allow you to, to close out our, our session. Thank you. Thank you, Viva. Do you want to just finish off? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much to Tim and um, Hardiel both for an excellent presentation. I know the audience are happy to uh, thank um, with me. Um, so, and the, what I would suggest to the audience is, the, well, I would be sending, we would be sending the slides, um, today's slides and also the toolkit that team and the uh, Hardiel mentioned, uh, measuring for assuring projects. They both will be sent within the next two days. Um, and also please, Please, could you please complete tonight? You should get a survey through your email 
and complete it today while it's fresh on your mind about this uh, presentation. And uh, let us know. We also have one of the questions. What would you like to, what sort of uh, projects, what sort of presentation would you like? What topic would you like to see in the future? So that will help us to decide on what we can, what we can present in the future. So please do that as well. Um, that will be within the survey. And thank you very much for everybody for attending. And especially thanks for the, our pre two presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. All the best. Take care. Bye bye, everyone.